It's going to give us some little housekeeping, um, and make a an housekeeping announcement, and then begin our recording. Want everyone to do uh, be aware that we are recording this session, um, and those items that are recorded are grammable. Grammable. <laughs> um, also, if you can. Uh, Put your chats if you have questions. If you'd like to use the chat box, it uh, might be a little bit easier. I will be periodically muting everyone um, as presentations are given just to keep uh, the feedback to a minimum. So if you need to ask a question or uh, something, just make sure that you are unmuted. That's it. Great. Thank you very much. And I'll let you press record. Okay. Looks like we're there now. Um, I would like again to welcome you uh, to this meeting and uh, I'm, I'm excited and I'm nervous about this meeting because I'm trying to do, I'm doing something different or we're all doing something different. We have our presentations, but we're also going to have a panel presentation in the second hour. And um, with this, I'm hoping to get feedback from not just the panelists, I mean, they're going to lead out on the discussion, but I'm hoping to get some feedback from from everyone. It's been an interesting time with um, the COVID-19 uh, era and how um, our lives have certainly changed, whether it's work or school, um, simply shopping, um, doing so much more online than we've ever done before, um, if we have those capabilities. And so that's why we're here. We're making sure that we have these resources, not just for us and our neighbors, but for everyone across the state. And um, I would like to personally thank, um, well, I can't personally thank, but I'd like to collectively thank uh, many people here who I have had the opportunity to talk to over the last few months and have given me some guidance and instruction. And there's more people that um, even, I've been here two years now, just, I don't know, this time has really, uh, it has finally, it has flown. In fact, I couldn't believe it's already been three months since our last meeting. Um, I know it feels like it's been forever ago. Oftentimes we say, oh my gosh, four days ago feels like four years ago and this, uh, at this time. But all of a sudden for me, I felt like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it's already been three months and here we are again and already been working from home for this long that now I come to work and I feel totally handicapped. I don't know how to use my uh, technology here. But having said all that, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is, um, as um, a representative from the state for the broadband of Utah, we have also been, um, had our eyes wide open, uh, open wide with all of this that has happened with COVID and that there really is um, some gaps and there's opportunities that the state can assist. And um, as I have been here for two years, and I would say I have learned a lot, and I have learned things sometimes a good way and sometimes a hard way. Sometimes I just have stumbled and fallen and uh, found that I wasn't maybe doing things the best way, although all, all intentions were always good. But um, I appreciate everybody, those that have stepped forward or have reached out to me and given me some guidance. And I am admitting I still have a lot to learn. As an advocate for you, the providers, and uh, all the several entities um, for the state broadband and the future of broadband. That's where our, kind of our focus is on this meeting today is, is the future of broadband. Um, whatever information you can give me is going to help all of us. So that is my soapbox, is that um, I don't admit to knowing everything, I uh, have a lot to, still to learn, but anything that you can pass on and share and whatever we can pass on and share with each other, these meetings, um, I think can help us all. And if we find that there's opportunities to um, maybe take some information to our legislators, um, we, we should do that. Having said all that now, uh, we will now turn the time over to Peter Jay. He's the technical leader and board member um, and point of the Mountain Chamber of, the point of the Mountain Chamber of Commerce. He is representing today Utah Ignite and he's going to, um, we heard from um, Glenn Reichardt last meeting with US Ignite and um, Peter Jay, um, we would like to hear some things that are happening locally in the state of Utah, some successes and opportunities and exactly what they're doing. So Peter, we'll turn the time over to you now. Thanks. 
I think we may have lost Peter. Uh oh. I don't see him in the room anymore. Okay, we'll give him 20 seconds. Or we'll have Glenn pinch hit, or we can go to our next speaker and come back to him. Glenn, we can't hear you. I know you're talking. He needs to unmute. Yeah, well, I needed to both unmute and uh, turn <laughs> off the mute button on my microphone. Uh, you have to do both, actually. Um, I usually have one on or the other, but I had both. So uh, I recommend we uh, uh, go on to the next speaker and come back to um, uh, Peter. Okay, we'll do that. Kelly, are you ready to go? You, Kelly Cole, she's the Strategic Initiatives Manager with Utah Education and Telehealth Network. And she is going to tell us about the, the um, kindergarten through 12th and higher education yeah. technical initiative. And maybe Glenn, if you just. Yeah, I can do that. I'm happy music. to do that. Can Thanks. you hear me? Yes. Let me just put my camera on so you can see me. Okay. Okay, can you hear me and see me? Okay, sounds good. Okay, well, thank you for having me um, present today. It's always great to present to this group. Um, and I have something kind of new and exciting to talk about today that's kind of different than what they usually talk about. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you know this, but the state of Utah was given um, some funding through the CARES Act legislation and the legislature approached Ray Timothy probably about a month ago um, and asked us to come up with a statewide um, technology strategy um, for, for K-12, for higher ed. Um, and so Ray and I and our team have been working on what we're calling the Public and Higher Education Technology Initiative. And so what we were tasked um, with doing is we reached out to all of the higher ed institutions. We reached out to um, our partners internally and we had everybody um, suggest uh, proposals that could be funded through the CARES um, Act funding that, that we could implement. Um, and UETN was asked to kind of collect that information and bring it to the legislature for approval. And so we, we very quickly reached out to everybody and, um, and we put through a proposal to the legislature that was the largest amount of money we've ever, um, we've ever talked about. So it was $125 million. Um, and we proposed under that umbrella, many, many projects that would hit all parts of the state. They would, um, they would purchase um, all sorts of equipment, um, all sorts of software, all sorts of um, professional development opportunities. And so we, we came up with, um, with a list of projects that we felt could be funded um, through the CARES Act. We submitted that to the legislature a few weeks ago. And then we actually were approved for, for that large amount of money, which is more than we've, um, more than we've dealt with previously. Um, and so um, that being said, we are acting more as the administrator for all of these projects through higher ed and through K-12. And then there are projects that UETN is, is implementing that are enhancing the services that we provide to those institutions already. So I'm gonna kind of walk through and give you an idea of what will be happening in the next six months. Um, and one of the challenges um, and opportunities at the same time, I guess, is that we, um, we need to spend all of the money within six months. Um, and it needs to be um, items that are responding to the coronavirus pandemic. They need to be up and operational. Um, there's also rules that we can't um, purchase anything that was already in a state approved budget. And so um, we vetted all of the projects to make sure that they were meeting that criteria. Um, and so we have actually some really, really exciting projects that, that we're working on. Um, and what you'll see in the next six months is, um, so one of the big projects that, that we're just 
um, nailing down right now is that we're giving all of the um, we're giving all of the K-12 institutions the opportunity to upgrade their Wi-Fi on on premise, and so um, a lot of the schools it, it, they'll be either replacing equipment that's pretty old, or they'll be um, adding Wi-Fi to non-instructional parts of the of the campus. So, for example. Um, maybe they want to add um, Wi-Fi hotspots like in a stadium in a high school or um, more in a field or cafeteria area and that will allow um, that will allow more social distancing so that we can make the footprint at the schools a little bit bigger um, so that they have more opportunities and then in in cases where if there's either a school shutdown or blended learning situation people could come out and be in the parking lot or in the field or wherever and spread out and they could still use the internet um, and and one of the things that we really tried to do is come up with projects that that had a dual purpose of responding to the pandemic but also were going to give lasting impact to the state and i think that we have really done a good job at achieving those goals because um, that that equipment is going to obviously help respond to the pandemic short term but it also is going to allow a lot of our schools to have um to have more enhanced wi-fi in the years to come and and i think that you know as we all know uetn we've we've been really lucky to work with our partners and we've built this really um robust comprehensive fiber network and this is going to help us leverage that fiber so that that user experience on campus um, is going to be um, a lot better than it than it has been in the past. Um, and like I said, getting out into some of those non instructional areas um, is going to be really key to to this project and Jim Stewart is is heading that um, that project up and they're in the process of reaching out to the schools right now and figuring out what the needs are. Um, so another another item that that we're working on um, through that project. Um, so in the area of devices, one of the really great opportunities that we're giving. Um, so we reached out to every um, higher ed institution in the state. So the U of U, Weber State, SUU, all of there's eight colleges and universities. Um, all of them have been given funding opportunities and so um, each of those institutions has a few different projects. So they have um, projects where they're again enhancing their Wi Fi on campus for the same purpose that the schools are. So you're going to see enhanced Wi Fi at all the colleges and universities throughout the state. Um, and then they were also um, able to submit some software projects um, and that we're still we're still kind of working through which software projects um, will be funding, but and also um, some of the uh, security tools for that software, making sure that um, that they're robust against any kind of cyber attacks. There's some of that that's being funded right now through this money. And then um, there's also they are also being given the opportunity to purchase laptops that can be lent out to students. Um, the for example, the Marriott Library at the U of U. Um, they've been given a, a, a nice budget to purchase um, laptops and we're we're thinking that throughout the state there's probably going to be maybe about 6,000 6,500 new laptops that are going to be available to lend out to students and sometimes to faculty for them to be able to um, to do any homework or do anything that they need to. Uh, there are a few projects that are doing some hotspots. Um, those aren't super widespread just because we can only fund for a certain amount of time. So there will be a few institution, institutions that are lending out hotspots for the next year. Um, and then, like I said, there's software. And then there's also, um, we're also doing some professional development with the funding. So both our internal professional development team that serves K-12 um, they'll be we're working with them to finalize what what kind of content will be will be offering for teachers um, for the fall and then um, through the U of U's continuing ed program they're actually doing some really great projects where they're offering some additional um, courses on um, like computer programming they're offering some summer bridge programming 
they're offering some ACT prep classes. Um, they're doing some ESL classes. They are, um, yeah, so they're, they're doing a bunch of really great things. And so, you know, we, in a short amount of time, we're able to really take that funding, spread it out to every corner of the state, spread it, spread it out to multiple types of projects um, and have, so I right now, I think I have somewhere between 70 and 85 individual projects that are spread throughout the state that we'll be working with them over the next um, few months to get them implemented very quickly. Um, we've just never done anything on this scale, but we feel like it's going to be incredibly impactful, both short term and in the future. So that's just kind of a broad global view of what we're doing with the CARES Act money. And if well, anybody has any questions, I'm happy yeah. to take questions. Please. And one thing I will say, um, we are, so you're not going to see a lot of like big fiber projects, obviously, because of the, um, the short time period. Um, but you are going to see a lot more of like the equipment and wireless and all of those types of tools being enhanced that we can implement quickly and, um, and leverage the fiber infrastructure, fiber infrastructure that we currently have. Will there be any upgrades to Wi-Fi 6? Yes, there is a huge Wi-Fi 6 initiative that will be happening at the schools. That's, a, that's one of the major priorities. I have a question about this funding. You said it has to be spent by the end uh, or the end of six months. Um, yes. But it, is anything ongoing like it's earmarked or it actually absolutely has to be spent? So it absolutely has to be spent. Um, in some cases, we are still figuring out um, oh, wow. office, like software, software contracts, contracts, if we can prepay something that would be um, for a few years for software. And we're still, we're waiting on that determination. But like all of the, a lot of this, a lot of these projects are equipment that we're purchasing that is obviously going to be in place and there's no ongoing fees for that. It'll be up and running, so. Wow, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, lots of really cool things happening. And, and, and I feel really good about that we're, um, that we're kind of spreading this out to multiple parts of the state and multiple partners. And I think there's not a part of the state that won't be impacted by this project. Very good. That's quite a lot for you to have to take on your plate in a short amount of time. Yeah, I mean, we have a really incredible team that's helping and, and so they're, they're putting a lot of things on hold just to get purchases and, and we've, we've put pretty um, intense deadlines on our own team, um, especially to purchase any equipment because we're really concerned about supply chain and getting things in time. And so we want to have almost all the equipment purchased by the end of the month. So we're doing very aggressive purchasing right now. And, and are, you are you finding the equipment? Is there an availability? Um, so far we're, we think that we're going to be okay, but we just want to get, we just want to get things purchased so that if there are delays, we'll still meet that six month mm -hmm. deadline. And we want to have things as operational as quickly as we can, obviously to help the students and the schools and um, get through everything. So. Great, exciting. Um, just one last question, I guess, is in reference to this Wi-Fi that you're getting all over, because I know we've been in conversations, you and I, with the State Board of Education, as far as getting uh, Wi-Fi accessibility outside the buildings, too. Will yeah. this Wi-Fi enhance, will this, um, so if the school's open and then it doesn't work or something happens and they have to close them again, will this be available outside? Yeah. Yeah, the goal is is that they would have they would be able to have um, a better footprint of wireless, so they'll add to what they have. And and like I said, like there there are a lot of schools that are doing um, that'll have more accessibility outside the building, and I think they're taking that into account as they do their planning. And it's it is up to the school themselves, but but I think what we're seeing is that there's a trend in that direction where you would have more um, Wi-Fi opportunities off the building, on campus. Mm -hmm. So. That allows yeah. more social distancing, which is good. Even if the buildings are open, that allows people to be able yeah, to like if you had the a teacher nice that anyway. wanted to right. bring kids outside or, yeah, yeah, there's more opportunity to do those types of things. Very good. That's great. Um, did anybody else have a comment or a question? Thank you very much, Kelly. Appreciate hey, that. You're that welcome. Is very, We're excited very about excited. it. Yeah, that's great. And you do have a good team there. And I will. Um, 
led to the UETN. We're, we're very fortunate to have them in Utah and the state and already getting broadband so far across the state and just enhancing that. Do we have Peter J back? Yes, I'm back. Sorry, I got okay. for some reason. <laughs> it's okay. We knew you were there in, cyber, in that cyber world somewhere. So yeah. we will, I made your introduction already, Peter J, and just if you would give us um, uh, how Utah Ignite is working locally. Okay, uh, can I share my screen too? I made a quick PowerPoint. Like, yeah, oh, Becky, there. can you help him share his, yeah, I think you can just click the green, share your screen. Okay. Just down at the bottom in the middle. Probably have to hover over. Can you see it? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I'll start the slideshow. Okay, I threw these together real quick for you guys. So I uh, figured some visuals would help. The so Utah Night Gigabit Community and Gigabit Apps. Just on my background real quick, I'm the Director of Economic Development at Utah Valley University. I did work for USTAR for a little while. Uh, we put $2 million in the Utah Internet of Things industry. I started the Utah IoT Meetup page. We have about 1,700 followers on it. And I've been working with Utah Ignite for the last couple of years. Um, US Ignite, which is the national organization, was kicked off by the National Science Foundation in the White House to find the future of the internet. They decided it was going to be high speed, low latency, and software defined networks. They had to decide if they wanted the infrastructure or the apps first, and they decided that it would be best to find the applications that require the high speed internet, and, and that would create the demand to create the infrastructure. So that's what they've been doing for the last several years. So that's kind of the role that Utah Ignite plays in the state of Utah. Um, Utah Ignite is one of 30 smart gigabit communities throughout the United States. We're one of the few that is statewide instead of just city or local. It is partnered with the Chamber of Commerce. I think we're the only one in the U.S. that's partnered with the Chamber of Commerce. It's through the, isn't it? Through the Corner of the Mountain Chamber of Commerce, formerly Lehigh Chamber. We're also working with South Valley, American Fork, and others. Um, so we built up the IoT community, and then uh, the next step is kind of to bring the cities and the IoT community together to create smart cities. Um, with US Ignite, they've, uh, on their website, they've got over about 100 applications listed on their website, technologies that, that meet those requirements for high speed, low latency, and uh, software defined networks. They typically require them to be open source, shareable, and replicable projects. You can find those on the US Ignite website, usignite.org forward slash apps. In Utah Ignite, some of the things we've been doing. We've been doing smart cities lunches and webinars, uh, smart cities grant competitions. We're building a smart cities lab at Utah Valley University. We're putting together a smart cities directory on our Utah Ignite website. We're also uh, promoting federal grants that are related to smart cities. I'm gonna go through each of these real quick. So we've been doing these monthly smart cities lunches and webinars since last June, I believe. We've been have, having companies come in and speak about the projects they're working on with smart cities. We've had, uh, I mean, I, I put the Lieutenant Governor's picture up here. We had him speak in December about smart cities from the state, state level. Uh, we had our uh, state IT and CIO speak in April about our technology response to COVID-19 in Utah. The purpose of these is education, networking, and connecting the cities with the IoT smart city community. Um, to educate our city leaders and, uh, and connect them with our Internet of Things companies and smart city companies. So this is some of the stuff we've been doing on a monthly basis to bring the community together. We've been in smart city grant competitions. So ex one example is we did, the, we did one competition for air quality, a University of Utah team won. It was where they were putting more sensors at a micro level, partnering with Purple Air and, and others. To, uh, to get a more uh, micro analyzing of air quality and then creating images overlaid on those on maps of the air quality. The reason it met the high speed uh, broadband requirements is you put all the images on a server and on your PC, you could scroll backward and forward through time over the images as it 
scrolled the image as it requires high bandwidth. We also had a competition where we awarded some grant funds to a virtual reality technology where they're putting uh, multiple people on VR headsets in a classroom, 50 to 100 people, all in the same classroom at the same time in a virtual reality environment. Um, we also awarded some funding to some browser speed technologies. So they, this group said they already had the uh, high speed bandwidth in Utah, but the browser was the limitation for speed. So they were working on some technology to speed up the browsers. Uh, deep brain simulation, we didn't fund, I don't know if we funded that one. Glenn Reichert's worked more on that one. And, uh, but I know it's it basically it requires the low latency. You can't, you're, you're doing telehealth, manipulating brain stimulation than a, or someone in another city. You can't have a delay in, in your speeds. So those are some of the examples of uh, projects in Utah, along with others. We're working on a smart cities lab at Utah Valley University. It's in the U of U Business Resource Center. In Utopia, I think Roger's on this call as well. He, uh, they donated a 10 gigabit connection. That's already all hooked up at, at our lab so we can build technologies and software applications and test them on this high-speed network. We can also replicate the other US Ignite projects in this lab. We're also partnering with Utah Open Source and others on this lab. Utah Open Source is a network of about 15,000 software engineers here in Utah and on the Western United States. Uh, the, the idea is that we develop, test, and deploy smart city technologies and applications in this lab. So we can build the hardware, the electronics, and the software locally, test them in the lab, test them on broadband networks in Utah, and push these sensors and other technologies out to our communities. Um, let's see. Okay, we've already we've been putting together a smart cities directory. Probably needs to be updated. You can see our list of categories here for smart cities companies and projects in the state of Utah. Um, so if you're trying to get involved in the smart cities community, I mean, this is where we're, we're putting it together. Like I said, we created the IoT network several years ago and built it up over the years. And now we're trying to connect it with cities. Okay. There are, there are also a number of federal smart cities grants. Um, I have them listed on the Utah Ignite website as well. I've actually just embedded the US Ignite website for it. There's about, I think there's over 20 grants available right now that people can apply for from the Department of uh, Commerce, Energy, um, Economic Development, and others. So if there are any cities or companies who are looking for federal grants for smart city related projects, we have them listed on the website. We can, uh, we can be a partner and support companies, universities, or government agencies applying for those grants. Okay, so that's what I had for today, what we're, what we're talking about. Um, I don't know if Glenn wants to add anything or if you guys have any questions for me. I'll stop sharing my screen. That is a lot of information, uh, Peter. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, so some of those federal grants that you uh, just referred to right there at the end um, for the smart cities, what are, are they primarily along the Wasatch Front or there in your uh, area in Utah County that are taking right. advantage of this? Or is it there opportunities for all counties? I think all counties could apply. Um, I'll share the I'll share the link in the chat, but I don't think it's restricted to any geographic area as long as they comply with the grant requirements for any of these grants. Um, and do they already need to have uh, a basic uh, broadband coverage or requirement? Uh, they're not all for broadband. Some of them might be related to that. Okay. Each individual grant. I just shared the link to the U.S. Ignite list of. Uh, federal grants, funding opportunities. So some of them aren't even related to broadband, some of them are energy, some of them are solar, alternative energy, some of them are transportation, but they're all just smart cities related. And obviously any smart cities projects have to have some sort of broadband and wireless supporting them. 
So but these might be more the it might be the application, some of them that require the high speed internet grants for the infrastructure itself. So I just shared the link though if anyone wants to click on it and take a look through the grants opportunities. Yeah, thank you for that. Do we have any questions from anyone else listening in? Uh, thanks to Utopia for that uh, donation. They're a great partner. That's, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, through public-private partnerships, and we probably should um, collaborate a little bit more, maybe across the state, to have some things like this happen. My question about, does it go across the state? We've got great broadband coverage across the state, and yet I know there's still some locations, because I've been getting some phone calls of areas that we we still don't have it. And so the idea of turning into a smart city, it's like, let's get the basic basic first, but I don't know, maybe there's some way to integrate all of it together through a, a, a public-private partnership. Yeah, if anyone else wants to look more into our Smart Cities Lab or partner with us on some things, we're happy to talk to you about that as well. We, we're still building it, we're still purchasing some uh, uh, 3D printers, other fabrication equipment, electronics, equipment to build the electronics boards and, and things like that. So it should be built out in the next month or two. So. Okay. Well, he's given me some, some good ideas. I hope maybe for the rest of you as well. Thanks, Peter, for coming again and, and being here and being ready. That's, that's really good information. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we will um, shift back to uh, UETN and we have Jeff Egley here with the, he's the Technical Services Associate Director. Um, he is going to give us an update on the uh, San Juan and Daggett projects. Yeah, good morning. Um, I know that uh, Dave Ryan from Strata Networks, I believe is still on the call and, and Jared Anderson from Emory Telecom and so I invite them uh, as I uh, give these brief updates uh, to be able to also provide some uh, uh, detail where we're fortunate to work with both of those providers on these uh, projects. Uh, the Daggett project, uh, uh, approximately 70 miles of uh, fiber connecting from uh, Vernal over to uh, uh, Manila and Dutch John. And I'll just bring up one image here that may just kind of help as we, as we talk. So uh, with these projects, uh, I'm gonna focus on Daggett first. Uh, uh, really at the end of this summer, going into fall is when it's uh, to be completed. Uh, we were very fortunate with Strata Networks on the Daggett project that uh, the span from Vernal to uh, Manila was completed uh, just right prior to the end of the calendar year. And so we were able to connect up uh, uh, the uh, the district high school elementary school there with uh, gigabit uh, uh, going into the new year which was which was huge uh, yeah, we really didn't uh, foresee getting that quite as early as we did strata was able to find some ways to make that work and and credit them for that uh, great work we also have a span that goes over to flaming gorge elementary in uh, dutch john uh, that work is close. It's my understanding they're through the dam and, and really just in, uh, I think, so, some of the last remaining work to uh, uh, complete that uh, connection as well. And then uh, for our portion of this network and, and these improvements, this work will be uh, complete. Uh, Dave, if you're still on, uh, I don't know if there's some additional detail you may want to share just on this this project in general and, and uh, uh, provide a uh, Strata Networks perspective. Doesn't sound like he may, he may have had to uh, drop off. He was, he was on earlier. So we're, we're excited to see that. Uh, there was a lot to navigate there. It ties well back into our network, back into uh, Vernal. That County, this really, uh, other than some cross town uh, fiber, uh, this was really the first introduction uh, of fiber into Daggett County of, of any uh, significance. So, very excited to see this uh, completed and, and it'll have a ripple effect on the communities and the benefit it provides also to uh, 
the wireless providers, uh, UDOT, others that uh, will benefit from this. So excited to see this completed. Um, the San Juan project, it's broken down into two stages. Uh, a lot of our attention right now is still on stage one. And so stage one is approximately 42 miles of fiber that will connect from Blanding, Utah, down through the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe at White Mesa, connecting up their library ed and education center uh, there. And then it works its way on south and uh, we connect over into Montezuma Creek to Whitehorse High School, as well as to Montezuma Creek Elementary. And then on over to Bluff, uh, where uh, uh, San Juan uh, School District uh, has a uh, new school they'll be opening uh, soon. Uh, they're, uh, uh, that's under construction right now. Um, and so we'll see that new school in Bluff uh, connected up when it's ready. So uh, Strata, or no, excuse me, Emory has been doing all the work they can in, in segments to complete this work. Uh, the, the, the greatest challenge that continues to, uh, to go on is, is the permitting process in White Mesa, approximately 11 miles south of uh, Blanding. Uh, there's quite a process with both the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe and BIA goes back and forth. The, uh, the, uh, the tribe is broken up into, at White Mesa is broken into allotments with uh, community members associated with each allotment and an approval process, actually multi-tiered approval process that uh, 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 Emory Telecom and their contractor must go through on this. And so we're in the second stage of a second round of approvals for with those allottees. Once that work is done, it goes back to uh, the BIA, I believe, and, and Jared uh, may be able to provide some additional detail. But while it appears that a lot of progress is being made, which it is, it's hard to really guess, estimate how much time it will take to complete that process. It's very tough. And now with uh, the lockdown with, with COVID, uh, a lot of this work uh, has been done door to door, literally having to visit and, and we've had some local help from Griselda Rogers who runs the library, visiting with community members, Emory Telcom, UETN, uh, UDOT others participating in community meetings. But that's where the bulk of the work is focused right now to complete this uh, permitting that was necessary on the Navajo portion of uh, Montezuma Creek. Uh, I think uh, the bulk of that is done, and so it's it's really getting this uh, important segment uh, approved so uh, they can tie that down. Uh, there's a second stage that'll go on down to uh, Monument Valley. We'll go to uh, the high school and the elementary school, and then on around to uh, Navajo Mountain. That is squarely in the uh, permitting process. And uh, as uh, Kelly talked earlier this morning about uh, CARES funding, the Navajo Nation is involved in some of their own projects, really addressing a huge need within the nation for access and connectivity uh, and focusing a great deal on wireless. And uh, we've used every opportunity to discuss the uh, significance of bringing fiber in the the foundation it provides to supporting that kind of connectivity. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of work still to be done on, on uh, stage two. Uh, we see that, I think it's approximately 150 miles of fiber. That's gonna take some time just going through the processes that the Navajo Nation has uh, in order to get that approved. And some of that will be on a Navajo Nation basis. Some of that's on a chapter basis with, the, uh, with each chapter that uh, that fiber passes through. Uh, with that said, Jared, I don't know if you're still on, if you would like to provide a, an Emory Telecom perspective just on the work that Emory's doing right now uh, associated with these projects. Hey, Jeff, this is Brock Johansson. So on that phase one, pro, uh, the phase one, there's three, there's some private and then there's some BLM and some uh, White Mesa Ute. Um, and then some Navajo sections on that first phase. And like you said, the white, the, we've already gone in and done the private area, the private ownerships and the BLM ownership sessions. We've constructed those. The Navajo session, the president's office signed off on that a while ago, and that's just sitting on BIA's desk for signature. And then we can do the Navajo sections. And so if any, I know sometimes reps from BIA get on, 
if there's a rep from BIA, we just need a signature and we can start constructing the Navajo portions. So any help, I don't know if we have a BIA rep on, but a lot of times we do. We need that signature. And then we can, we've got crews down there, the pipe's sitting there. We just need BIA to sign off. The Navajo uh, president already has. And then on the White Mesa, you, what you said is exactly right. There's eight or nine allotments and every allotment except one has signed off. And like you said, when we get the list from BIA, it's an address and there's no phone numbers or anything. So it's a physically going and knocking on the door, but with the COVID-19, we're not allowed to go and physically knock on the door. So you can send a million mailers, but it, we're having a hard time getting to the, those last few allottees to sign off on the last allotment. And some of the members of the tribe are trying to help, like you said, Gazelda is trying to help and others. But um, that's kind of the situation down there is we need BIA to sign the document so we can keep those plows moving down there. And then on the White Mesa, uh, UDOT and we, UDOT and I have a virtual uh, meeting with the with uh, the Utes tomorrow to talk about this permit. So we'll hopefully break that loose a little bit. So. Thanks, Brock. Thanks for, thanks for sharing on that. Appreciate it. Uh, any questions, any comments just on either the Daggett or the, uh, uh, the San Juan project? Hey, Jeff, this is Dave Ryan. Sorry, I had, I had to leave one meeting and come to back to my office. And so I lost connection for a minute when you had. Oh, okay. The, the Daggett, I got a message from Tom. I, I, I discussed the work where really kind of, uh, the tail end for you to complete, uh, Flaming Gorge Elementary and Dutch John, any other detail you'd like to just share on that uh, project as a whole? No, just, um, yeah, I think that that synopsis is accurate. We're really close. We're, um, the, all of the pathway construction is complete. We're just now uh, doing all the fiber installation and splicing to get all the circuits ready to be turned up. And um, we're ahead of schedule. So we're really excited about that. And, and it's been a huge challenge for us as I'm sure the uh, Emory is having similar challenges with the work they're doing on that other project in San Juan. And, and uh, but, but it's been, a, it's been a, a really successful project from, from our perspective on, on various different aspects of it. So anyway, I don't know if there's any questions that you have specifically, but, but I think you're, your review of it is accurate. Great. Thanks so much, Dave. A any questions from anyone? Hey, I have a question for Dave Ryan. All right. Uh, this is Melinda Talbot at UETN. Hi, Dave. Hi, uh, Melinda. My question is, when when is your estimated turn-up date for all the sites, the last date of turn-up? Well, our, our due date is September 30th of this year. We're, we're trying to get them turned up before that so that they'll have service at the uh, Flaming Gorge Elementary in Dutch John for school to start this year. The Manila High School already has its circuit turned up. Our target right now, we're trying, we're doing everything we can to try to get it done, not just early, but early enough that we can have those circuits turned up for school to start. Um, so first, second week of August is where we're kind of. Oh, that would be great. Okay, I might pop you an email just regarding the FCC's deadline for the service. Um, so we make sure we are, we hit that mark. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, any other questions? Yeah, uh, this is James Toledo. Um, so this is for you, Jeff. Um, my office can probably reach out to BIA. So this would be the Navajo area BIA, is that correct? Right. To see if we can um, kind of just encourage them to sign off on the project so we so you guys could continue um, the project on the Navajo portion of, 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 the, of the line. So we can probably reach out to, to them to sign off on that. That'd be terrific. And if, if uh, when I get offline, uh, I could share contacts information, uh, you know, so that you have uh, 
Brock and Jared's uh, info and, and mine, James, that would be, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. So offline, just uh, shoot me an email and just include anyone you would like us to copy on the correspondence and we will, we'll, you know, we, we'll be happy to try to push this through. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Any other questions, comments? Well, I'll just wrap up to say, by saying that we really appreciate the, uh, the work uh, with uh, uh, Strata Networks and, and Emory Telecom. These are difficult projects. Uh, we value the partnership we have with everybody uh, as we uh, uh, work on the network throughout the state and, and uh, thank for the opportunity to uh, provide an update. Thanks, Rebecca. Oh, thank you. This is really, really good. Uh, great news and appreciate those that chimed in and, and uh, gave some more information. And James uh, Toledo, thank you for that. Um, our Governor's Rural Partnership Board met a few weeks ago, and I know that that was the main focus of the Department of Indian Affairs here in Utah. That is, was broadband and getting it to the tribes. Yes, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I know they will do everything they can to, to help with that. Um, I am excited to hear about uh, everything getting done in Daggett County. I was the recipient of a wonderful um, tour uh, last year with uh, Dave Ryan um, to see the work that, was, that they had done there. And it was remarkable the terrain that they had to cover. And just as remarkable was the fact that in this pristine area, you couldn't tell that they had even been there when it was done, when everything was laid back in place and they were just at the rapid pace they went to be so careful of the, uh, you know, the surrounding foliage and um, even, even the rocks, everything just was put back in place um, and, and at great distance that they needed to go and the challenges of getting through the dam were uh, miraculous according to them. <laughs> so I think this is uh, great news. And like I said, I've been here for two years and I've been getting updates. It seemed like that was the first thing on the agenda and it's still on the agenda. So these are, have been huge challenges for you, uh, Jeff, at the UTN and the communities there. And so it's nice to see this coming to an end. Um, we will now, uh, let's see where we're at. Oh, great, we've got Liz. Gabitus, did I say that close enough? She's from the State Library Division of Technology and the Innovation Coordinator. Um, I asked Liz to come and tell us everything that she has been doing some amazing um, things with the CARES Act and uh, broadband connection for the users of the state libraries. So Liz, I know you're here. I saw you and we'll turn the time over to you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me here, Rebecca. I'm excited to share what we have been working on. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen. I've got some slides here to pull up. And let's see. Okay, is that showing up okay? Okay, great. All right, so uh, in the first CARES Act, there was some funding allocated to libraries. And that went through the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is the normal funding mechanism for state library agencies and for our public libraries throughout uh, the nation. So in other uh, allocations in that act, they were given more broad directives. They were just told to respond to COVID. In the case of libraries, we were told specifically uh, primarily to address digital inclusion and related technical support and secondarily to address COVID. So IMLS also gave some additional directives once they passed on a portion of that funding to the state library agencies. Uh, we were told to expand digital network access, to purchase internet accessible devices, and to provide technical support. And we were encouraged to use SNAP data, unemployment data, and broadband access as factors to consider areas that needed uh, more focus within our state. So the state library came up with a three phase approach. In our first phase, we put 35% uh, of the funds that we received towards broadband projects. We were looking at high impact things, things that we could really um, try to take a lead on or try to make a meaningful impact on. 
and uh, really show some, some difference in the communities. In phase two, we focused on direct grants to libraries and we used 50% of our funds. And uh, that is where we're really focusing on digital inclusion. And then phase three is still ahead of us. We are holding back 15% of our funds in reserve and we're going to try to figure out uh, kind of what areas we've missed in our first two phases once we get later into this year and then determine what projects are going to have the greatest impact at that point. So I will just run through what some of these projects are looking like. Uh, phase one, a little more detail. Again, that's 35% of our funds and uh, we're looking for things that are immediate projects we can work on right away. We are very fortunate to uh, have been able to work closely with UETN on all of these projects. They're really the experts, they have great relationships and they've been able to uh, take, take these dollars a lot further than we ever would have been able to. So first off, we are working with the San Juan County Library. Jeff mentioned that fiber connection project, which is a really big deal. Um, a little stumbling block that we had with that project or that San Juan County had with that project was the increased cost of that fiber connection at two of the San Juan County Library's branches, those in Montezuma Creek and in Bluff. And so we were able to use these dollars for those monthly charges, also to upgrade the equipment at all eight of their branches and to provide remote management technology for that equipment since some of their branches are four hours apart from each other and they have one county IT person that supports their whole library. So this, uh, we were able to get those funds out right away. We're excited to see some difference being made. And uh, once that fiber connection is in, uh, they should have some support all the way through September of next year. We are also working with the Confederated Tribes of the Goshute Reservation. That's out on the west side of the state. And uh, the project there, so there's the tribal seat where there is fiber running, and then there are two communities that are a little bit removed and that have no connectivity at this point, or very, very limited connectivity. And so what we're excited about uh, is the potential for EBS spectrum in that area. So the tribe is working, the tribal leaders are working with a nonprofit that we found called Mural Net, which helps these tribes put in their applications for the uh, licenses for that spectrum. So as soon as that gets in, we're hoping to see um, that approval come through quickly, and then we will be able to move forward with the project. The goal is to get uh, radio in each of those three community locations so we can share that connectivity with the two uh, community locations where people actually live outside of the tribal seat. Another piece of that project is going to be providing devices for the tribal library to circulate to patrons. So those will be library devices circulated out to patrons, which can be used by students. They can be used by people looking to work remotely or looking to apply for a job. And uh, providing both the connectivity and the devices should be a really important piece of uh, shrinking that digital divide in that area. In a similar vein, uh, in White Mesa, just as Jeff talked about, once that fiber connection comes through, we're just gonna swoop in and provide the last couple of things we can after UETN has done all the hard work. So we are going to provide upgraded equipment for the library and education center so that they can uh, get better speeds inside the building and also outside of the building to enable that social distancing as well as uh, connectivity to that high quality network. And again, devices for the tribal library to circulate. So those are our phase one projects that are sort of in the works. Getting into phase two, that is 50% of our funds. So that was about $150,000. Oh, I didn't mention the amount allocated to our state was actually only $300,000 for libraries. I say only, it seemed like a large amount of money at the time, uh, but I'm really happy with how we've been able to stretch these dollars. So about 150,000 is for digital inclusion. We have put out the first 120,000 in direct grants to public libraries. And then we are reserving just a little bit. We are going to open some competitive grant rounds, which will be open to our libraries if they would like to get additional funds and also to museums and other community organizations that might, might need support. The goal here is for all of these digital inclusion projects to be very community driven. So we'll get a little bit into what those direct grants look like. Uh, as we pass them out to the libraries, we did tell them they could use up to 50% to respond to COVID uh, because again, that was our secondary directive but we encourage them really to focus on digital inclusion projects. And our libraries throughout Utah are in really different communities with really diverse needs. And in some communities, uh, lending hotspots is the greatest thing we could possibly offer. And in some communities, hotspots would have no use whatsoever. And there's something really different uh, that we wouldn't know at a state level, but that our library directors who are embedded in, in those communities do know. So our goal here is to really empower the local libraries to determine what project is going to be most valuable for their community 
and to use that funding we were able to get to them to make that decision, to make a plan, and to implement it and see it through to the end. So of those direct grants that we passed out, we've encouraged them to uh, be thinking about their plans, be assessing community needs, but kind of hold on on making a plan until we are able to offer a digital inclusion workshop, workshop series, which should be coming up in the next couple of months. So we have a great, uh, a great guy, Vikram Ravi, who's going to be treating, training those uh, or holding those workshops. So we have some different audiences that we are addressing. And the goal here is to really prepare all of our libraries to look at their community and assess what the needs are and come up with a long-term plan, much in the same way that we ask them to do strategic planning to address these issues and these gaps uh, in a long-term way. So we're encouraging them to wait until after these trainings to tell us what their plans are. And I'm, I'm really hoping to see some good plans. We've seen some so far already, uh, and I'll be sure to share what those plans are when they come through. I'm very excited about them. For some of our libraries that are, are really just uh, champing at the bit to get going, we did give them some spending guidelines. Most generally, we've said if, you're, if the, the equipment or technology or supplies or whatever you're buying is directly in response to COVID and directly in response to patrons who are now seeing a big gap between them and maybe their neighbors, yes, go ahead and spend it. If this is regular spending, regular things you've been meaning to do, it probably doesn't qualify. So these are kind of the broad strokes guidelines that we've provided to our libraries. So a little bit further along in phase two, uh, we are going to open competitive grants. The plan is to wait on these until after our digital inclusion trainings as well. Some of our libraries I anticipate will have plans that are bigger than the first allocation we were able to give them. So we're encouraging them to apply for these competitive grants. We're also opening this to other organizations that did not receive those direct grants, which may include museums, other community organizations. There's a lot of great groups out there and I'm sure that we'll see some good projects come out of these proposals as well. And then we're into phase three. I still don't know what this might look like, although every day I have new ideas that are less and less realistic. So I'm excited to see uh, what we end up deciding is uh, the major need and how we can most effectively address that with these, these remaining funds. This is our timeline. You can see right now we are in this, I don't know that it quite counts as late 2020 yet, but we're looking forward to phase three. We have put out our phase two direct funds and uh, phase one is still ongoing. We are getting those funds out. We are making those projects happen and uh, trying to move those things forward. So how am I doing on time? Looks okay. Okay. So I wanted to go over some things that we're kind of considering that we think our libraries may put a focus on with their direct grants that we expect to see in the competitive grants and also that we may end up looking at uh, with our third round of funding or the third phase of funding. So the first uh, thing here is connectivity and community support for a rural workforce. We've become more and more aware throughout this, this whole experience of how critical the ability to work remotely is, especially for our rural communities. And libraries as an already embedded community institution with a relationship with their areas are in a really unique position of opportunity to address these needs. So there are some limitations to the types of funding that we have. Uh, for instance, we usually can't use federal funding for capital improvements in our libraries. And that's something where a lot of our small libraries uh, kind of suffer. They've got small buildings. And so if we can build some support for them to be able to provide uh, better workspaces, maybe that means device blending, maybe that means in-house workspaces, um, I think there's a real way that they could answer a critical need there. Another opportunity is in-home school network access for student devices. So if a school is, you know, say one-to-one -one on Chromebooks and is able to get those out to students and we can put a robust network in a community where those devices can be automatically connected from home, that could be a real game changer. So I'm excited about those conversations that are already happening and how we might be able to uh, participate in those and how libraries might be a key player in that. Another trend that we're seeing in some other places is remote library services. Those look like kiosks or book pickup lockers or book vending machines or just a tower that gives out a Wi-Fi network so patrons can go and use their devices on the library network. I'm excited to see how those services end up being a part of rural Utah and how rural Utah uh, communicates with their libraries, especially in areas where we don't have community libraries already existing. We're also anticipating that a lot of our public libraries will choose to expand device circulation. Some are doing it now, some are not. Some really want to be and just haven't had the opportunity and this is exactly what they needed. So I'm excited to see how that changes and grows and uh, what kind of trends we see going forward. 
And finally, you may be aware that there are conversations going on right now about some additional funding for E-rate and for connectivity and device support. Uh, I think that if those things fall into place, this is a really great opportunity for libraries to work strategically with schools and uh, with our community partners throughout Utah to really expand that connectivity. So I'm excited about uh, the potential there. Some stumbling blocks we might face. I mentioned infrastructure for rural workspaces. Um, digital inclusion experts. For a lot of our libraries, this is the first time they've been asked to think critically about digital inclusion. And so that's a key piece of this digital inclusion workshop series we're planning to offer. I would love to be able to offer more expertise to our libraries as well. We also are excited about the potential of supporting uh, devices and being able to support the recurring charges that come with circulating devices for our libraries. That's a big area of need and something that we're trying to figure out how we can best help. And finally, FCC restrictions for how E-rate and E-rate connectivity can be used. Um, there are some good conversations going on. I feel like the FCC is listening to the concerns that libraries and schools and communities are expressing. And I, I hope to see some growth moving forward in what those policies look like and how we can best support our communities. So that is where we are with our CARES funds. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Liz. Um, I think you filled it all. Um, she's like a fire hydrant of information, isn't she? And she has done all of this within the last few months. I think there's really some opportunities when she talks about the uh, partnerships with the potential partnerships, either with private industry or in the communities. Um, I'm hoping that each of us that are here might take note of that. Um, I would like to share an opportunity. I know through our office uh, in the rural areas, we have a rural uh, co-working and innovation center grant, which just opened July 1. It's $250,000 that is competitive and a private nonprofit uh, community uh, school can apply for this um, that are setting up a co-working space and where she mentioned this opportunity to maybe apply for something through them uh, with the connectivity and community support uh, in a co-working space or a co-learning space. This uh, could be a great opportunity to leverage these funds. So that closes on September 1, just to let you know about that, Liz, as well. I should uh, share that with you. Um, it would be a something to talk about with these communities or the libraries or any center in this regard to say there's, this isn't the only fund but we have some other state funds that could help build something. Absolutely. I will pass that along to our libraries. I, I'm sure there will be some that are interested. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Rebecca. Yes, Jeff. This is Jeff Bagley. Um, I know Liz has heard this before, but I, I just with with James Toledo on and the E-rate team on and that uh, the connectivity on the, the nation and other tribal areas is so important that uh, I just I just wonder aloud if uh, that kiosk option may provide a mechanism to uh, establish chapter houses, which are more likely the locations within a Navajo community uh, where perhaps access could be provided. Right now, we don't really have a mechanism. We don't have anything that qualifies as a library, but uh, just exploring if there's future opportunities where those kiosks may provide a means to provide a presence and then also a, a mechanism to fund uh, an E-rated broadband circuit that could come into that location. So uh, just want to uh, put that out there, so. Yeah, I can say that's, oh, I'm sorry, go on. Oh, no, I just gonna say I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Jeff. That's absolutely a, a priority of mine that I'm working on on, on our end is uh, in this coming year adopting a definition of library services in a kiosk, which should hopefully set up kiosk to be eligible for E-rate service, uh, which should provide access points in really remote places where there may not even be an existing library service. So it's something that I, I'm working on and, and optimistic about. That's great. Great to hear. And again, as I mentioned at our Governor's Royal Partnership Board meeting, that was the uh, main focus of the tribe. Um, the Department of um, Indian Affairs was the broadband in on those uh, tribal nations. And so 
we, you would probably have some backing with um, this other organization. We, we, we should have this conversation um, with them. We have our meeting, another meeting coming up in just a few weeks and, and would be great to, to share this information with them. So we'll be in touch again. Absolutely. Thanks for <laughs> inviting me today. Um, thank you, Liz, very, very much. This has been great. Um, so before we go into our panel discussion, we um, have a, a group that I've invited um, to help us in, in a discussion of the future of broadband and the future, you know, this is the immediate needs and uh, long-term needs. Um, but before we do that, uh, if anybody's here, I wanted to take an opportunity before anybody had to leave if there were uh, a one minute update that anybody would like to, um, to share. I know that there's been opportunities for some federal funds. Uh, I don't know if any have pursued, have been awarded or looking towards or projects. Um, I'm happy to open the floor for the next five or more minutes, however it would take, if anybody has um, to get on. a brief update. Just unmute yourself and jump in. Okay, maybe think about it. If there's something at the end, then um, we can address it. I do hope that you will feel that you can um, unmute yourselves or put something mm -hmm. in the chat um, to add to our discussion with the panel um, that we'll be presenting. I have my notes. We have Jim Stewart, the Utah Education and Telehealth Network. He is the Chief Technology Officer. So, Jim. Are you there? Hey, Rebecca, I'm here. Hi, thanks. Good to be here Good with you. Show your face. We'd love to see you while we're <laughs> doing our panel. Um, is there anything you'd like to add at this time to what's been said? Well, uh, to start off with, I just look around at who's here. I see a lot of people that are my collaborators and I've worked closely with and uh, a lot of people that uh, have been uh, good advisors for me and I've learned a lot from and I don't know that I have the best information, but I certainly have a perch that's unique and that uh, bring a different perspective and I'm looking forward to sharing that as we have this discussion. Good, I agree, thank you. Um, second, I have, we have with us Allison Stapleton Srivastava. Allison is in my, she's at GoEd as well. She is our data scientist and she has um, been a real, she's new with GoEd. I think she's been here, what, about a year now, Allison, and has provides a lot of great information and data. And I knew I could turn to her and get some um, good information as far as demographics. Um, are you there, Allison? I'm here, yeah. Thank Yay. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And I know Allison has a presentation, so I have a, we'll have a specific question for her and I get to give her the, the floor um, to be able to share that information at that time. Um, we also have Sarah Young from the Utah State Board of Education. She's the Director of Strategic Initiatives. And I met Sarah right, um, kind of at the beginning of the COVID-19 um, era. And she is an amazing organizer and has done so much for bringing people together, the UETN and the State Board of Education and others of us to uh, generate um, thought and ideas as to how to use the CARES Act fund and uh, getting uh, connectivity to the students across the state. Are you there, Sarah? I am. Um, I am here in mask because I'm actually 
um, at our office, um, which is still in the Salt Lake City area, um, and we are in the process of sorting PPE, so 750,000 masks for <laughs> teachers and students. So that is why you see me uh, repping my uh, PPE today. Just definitely appreciate the opportunity to have uh, K-12 um, and USBE representing the great leaders at this organization um, in this panel um, and before this really expert group. So thank you. Good, good. And I think the mask will not be a hindrance for you at all. The first time I got online in a meeting with Sarah, she, if you haven't noticed already, she talks with her hands a lot. So you won't even need to see her mouth. She, I, in fact, I almost thought she was signing the, the meeting. I thought, is she signing? <laughs> she uses her hands so much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And then we finally have, with the Utah Rural, Rural Telecom Association, we have, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Yes, uh, good morning, Rebecca. This is Douglas Meredith. I, uh, I'm a consultant with JSI, and I work with URTA with Kira, and I will be uh, presenting some information <clears throat> that we've gathered from the Rural, Associ the Rural Association members. Uh, regarding uh, the question on the future of broadband and uh, what to do going forward. Great. Thank you. I'm excited for this. Um, so I have some questions and I'm just going to, I can direct them to a specific person. And if, then if others have, would like to provide some additional input, that would be great. But um, maybe the first thing to do would to um, go ahead and, and See these. Um, I don't know if you want the question or if you want to do your presentation first. I know the question I have for Allison will probably lend to her presentation. Um, so maybe let's just start with you, Allison. How would that be? So while you're getting your shared screen up, um, the question I had for her if there were certain geographical areas or demographics where there is a greater impact due to the lack of broadband. Um, prior COVID, post, during COVID, or even afterward. And, um, and then I threw this out at her and I says, do you, what do you think, is there any correlation between the underserved communities and the COVID-19 positive test rates? So maybe that was presumptive to think that maybe there could be a correlation, but in any regard, I think it's interesting to at least look at the data to, uh, to compare. So we'll give you the, the floor, Allison. Well, thanks so much. Um, so all of the numbers that I'm sharing with you today are publicly available. The majority of them are through the American Community Survey um, 2018 five-year estimates. And the uh, last is from Utah Broadband Now. So if you have any questions about the numbers or want to know um, how they were calculated, you are welcome to reach out to me. And they're also just available out there in the world. Uh, so the first slide that we're looking at is this number of the percentage of households with broadband internet as a whole. Um, and I've divided these up into a few cohorts. Uh, the first one is urban, so urban um, being defined as along the Wasatch Front, and hard hit urban, and that would be urban areas that have been most, um, most affected by the pandemic in terms of positive test rate numbers. And that's primarily the west side of Salt Lake, so Rose Park, Fair Park, Glendale, and a rural community and San Juan County as well, which of course has been um, hard hit by the pandemic. So statewide, about 10.8% of households are without broadband internet. Among urban counties as a whole, that number dips to about 10%. But when we compare this number to urban neighborhoods who've had a large number of COVID-19 cases, that number jumps up to 18% without broadband. Similarly, 12% of rural households are without broadband compared to 47% of households in San Juan County. And this number rises to 78% when we're observing just Native Americans in San Juan County. So next we're going to look at children statewide without broadband. And children here is just defined as households with kids younger than 18. So this slide shows a number of households Without broadband for ages under 18, like I said, 10% more households with children from the hard hit urban group were without broadband compared to the urban group overall. And San Juan County had 41% of its households without broadband compared to 
fact is about 32% more than the rural cohort overall. And here we're looking at the difference in households with broadband for those in the labor force by employment status. So that's civilian labor force with um, people in the household 16 or older. So all geographies have greater broadband access for employed households. So hard hit urban households not only have a larger broadband gap between their employed and unemployed populations, but also had 6% more unemployed households without broadband compared to the urban group. And San Juan County had the largest gap with 68% of unemployment unemployed populations without broadband compared to 37% of employed. Now 50% more unemployed households were with broadband, without broadband in San Juan County compared to rural overall as well. And this last slide is the percentage of each county that has broadband access. So rather than looking at it by household broadband attainment, we're looking at countywide access. And we can see that both San Juan County down here and the harder hit urban areas have less broadband co coverage than their neighbors. So not only are households less likely to have broadband in these geographies, but also less access to broadband relative to neighboring counties as well. So that's, that's a pretty simple overview of the cohorts that are most heavily affected by the pandemic and how it relates to their broadband coverage. And you can see that there are some connections there uh, for underserved communities in the state. I think that map is quite significant. Even uh, I was surprised in Salt Lake County to see um, the broadband coverage there. Yeah, so that's I interesting. Agree. Thank you. And so um, feel free to interject on, on any of these questions or comments or to provide um, additional information. What What is your uh, overall take in this uh, the data that you researched? Yeah, so these estimates are from 2018, not long ago, but I think it does show that um, underserved communities, while COVID has brought unprecedented issues statewide, our underserved communities, it's really brought out that they have been, had less access for some time and it gives us a good opportunity to address that differentiation in access. And I'm really excited to hear about all the projects in rural Utah and San Juan and Daggett County that's this is my first time hearing about it today and I'm so excited about it. So thank you for all your great work. I'll send in the group chat, there was a question asked if they could get a copy of your slides. Can we make that available? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will, I can send out the slides to the group and there's also a, a Tableau um, dashboard as well that I'll make available. Hey, Allison, a quick question. Uh, the, when you say access, do you mean that they could have that if they subscribe to it or a lifeline? Or do you mean that they actually do have that service available in their home? So the first three slides looked at whether or not households had broadband in their home, so if they had a broadband subscription. While the last slide looked at the percentage of county that has broadband coverage. There's kind of two different ways of looking at it. One is household attainment and the other is countywide access. Okay, so we could increase attainment by more funding in general and access needs uh, more coverage. Correct. Okay, great. thanks very much. Allison, did, did you by chance um, consider looking at social determinants of health as you make this analysis? One of the things, it, this is a um, a popular approach right now in terms of looking at COVID impacts to um, relationship access, not just to the internet, but then you have food deserts and hospital deserts and et cetera. Um, and there is a clear correlation here that not that you could predict COVID, but we could easily look at social determinants of health and could have predicted which communities would be most impacted by a severe shutdown of the economy or education or, or um, you know, an attack on, 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 on quality of health. And, and so it is an interesting look. And, and I just wonder if diving a little deeper on the social determinants of health with your information could, could even further educate all of us. Yeah, that would be um, an excellent analysis. I am a little bit limited to the 
to the data. Uh, the census data doesn't quite look into that. I think that there's some assumptions that we can make based on um, just historical knowledge of different challenges that demographics face in the county. And I think another important one that um, all the ones that you pointed out are incredibly important as well. But another important one is um, in the pandemic, who is considered a frontline worker and who can't take days off if they are getting sick. Uh, especially for the hard hit urban areas, I think that's another um, additional consideration that we need to take into place as we look at how to protect different communities in global pandemics and other issues that I'm sure hopefully we won't face, but we want to prepare the best we can for. Allison, um, the definition of broadband, what was your definition of broadband? You're just looking at wireline broadband uh, for these data? Um, for the census, it was just defined as um, broadband internet present in the home. And the broadband now, I believe it was 25 plus, and I can send you all of that as well. Um, on the slides, I have all of the um, citations as, so you can, you can take a dive into that and I'll make it public. You note that the, um, the data that you're showing for Utah uh, matches quite nicely with the Pew Research data that's in mm -hmm. a national study. I don't know if you've looked at that or compared the difference, but it, it looks like the um, availability is just slightly higher in Utah than it is nationally for, um, for those cohorts. Yeah, I believe they used uh, the American Community Survey for that as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks Very so much. much. That's great. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention um, that we had so much help um, when the COVID-19 pandemic began and the schools were um, shut down basically and the students were home, um, a lot of people working from home. Um, I know our uh, Kiris Lawson from the Utah Rural Telecom uh, association reported that, uh, correct me if my numbers are wrong, but I've been sharing this, so I hope they're right, 1,850 rural homes were connected that had not been connected before, either through no cost or low cost um, service that was offered, and then um, 2,000 homes were upgraded that already had the service. That was done within just the first two weeks, and so that it probably has not stopped, but that was just within the first two weeks. Um, I, um, I, even with that, I know that there are still, you know, there are still gaps um, that we've heard in this meeting earlier. Um, after this, I have the question I have is that after this free or low cost connections, what is the rate of the households able to maintain this broadband connection? And is the Lifeline program or other programs, um, are they readily available statewide? whether it's urban or rural. Um, Doug, is this um, a good question to turn over to you? And would this yes, yes, we've, segue uh, uh, into your... <clears throat> yeah, and I'll let Kira uh, augment anything that I say or misstate, and uh, we'll, we'll get through it. The, uh, we did, uh, URTA did uh, poll its, its uh, members, and so we do have some, some data mm -hmm. on uh, how uh, the rural carriers uh, addressed the uh, the COVID response, uh, COVID uh, challenge, and what their responses were. Um, the carriers, there was a pledge by uh, initiated by Chairman Pai at the Federal Communications Commission to essentially um, address this need, and um, there were um, a majority, you know, eight of you know, majority of the state uh, rural carriers. Uh, offered uh, free service to students that uh, were needed to uh, conduct their education through uh, distance learning or through a you know a virtual virtual learning if we use that term and um, and many of them are offered speed upgrades for as for free for the period of time now the uh, the People who have, and that, that particular program is uh, phased out for a lot, a number of the carriers. Uh, some have continued to uh, to go on with that uh, that program through the summer 
session, the summer, summer school. Between 70, between 20 and 70% of households maintained the service after the program was over. So we had a number of people bunched at about 30% of the people um, actually uh, retained service. And then there were uh, carriers who experienced about a 70% uh, retention of service. That is to say the service that didn't, wasn't free any, anymore. And these, these uh, customers uh, actually um, uh, continued their subscription. The, uh, the effort of the rural carriers to go into this next year is um, there many are working, most, most are working with the, um, the school districts directly. Others are relying on UETN to uh, liaise with the school districts to make sure that the needs are met. So as far as the, and, and I think a, a good way to think about the, the response and the going forward concept is to think of it in terms of supply and demand. Similar to what Allison's graph showed, on the supply side, um, rural carriers and, and areas served by rural carriers in Utah have very high availability of service. And so the supply side, uh, really the challenges at the very beginning of the process was just the installations, because you had, as you mentioned, Rebecca, a number, a, a, you know, a number of um, of new requests for service, and that required installation uh, installation of uh, equipment um, at the at the customer location, et cetera, and turning on that service. So once that particular challenge got uh, was overcome, then the supply was uh, was was uh, quite adequate uh, for the for the need. Um, I should note as a as a double dagger asterisk or a footnote that um, permitting is always a challenge um, in, in the state and getting, getting infrastructure into areas like we've seen in the discussion with the, uh, the San Juan County, permitting is, is very important and it's, and it's really not the BIA issue, it's really a Navajo Nation and a White Mesa Ute issue for San Juan to actually get those, those uh, organizations and those governments to, uh, to uh, allow for permitting. But so aside from permitting, which is a global problem throughout the state, um, the uh, supply side is, it seems to be uh, adequate and customers are able to get the service as they need it. The demand side is really where the problem is. The, uh, a number of the, the people uh, carriers uh, surveyed their, their people who were discontinuing service and the primary reason for discontinuance uh, was uh, cost, was a fu their financial situation just wasn't adequate in order to provide, in order to uh, retain the uh, subscription. So I think in terms of a going, on a going forward basis, the looking at the, the demand and actually getting support for uh, individuals and households that need it, and these are the, co the, the the high risk cohorts that, that, that Allison showed is to really uh, focus in on how do we get uh, support to those households. As you know, the federal program, the federal lifeline program of, of, of allows or provides for broadband assistance. Um, but that, that program is uh, under federal lifeline guidelines and rules. And that means that uh, households have to be at lower than 135% of the national poverty, the, the poverty rate. That uh, for a household of four people, that means a household income needs to be um, less than, at or less than $35,000 a year. So there's, and so as you can see, that number is quite, quite a low number for a household of four. And so there's, in, even in addition to supplementing lifeline support, which is an immediate thing that can happen, and I think Kelly, uh, you know, is, is looking to, to, for programs that have immediate impact within the next six months, um, augmenting lifeline support, state lifeline support and matching uh, federal lifeline support would help those, in, those households at lower than $35,000. 
but there's also households that are above $35,000 don't qualify for Lifeline federal program, but uh, still would need some help in, in uh, getting, um, getting a service for this next school year. The state might want to look at uh, providing that, uh, that support to fill the, fill the gap. Um, and and uh, because really the, the biggest, uh, the, the, there were two, two uh, um, responses to not continuing with service. One was financial and one was we're moving out of the area. And so you know, the moving out of the area is not, a, not an issue. I mean, it's, it, they're just not available. Uh, those, those customers are moving away. And so that's why they're discontinuing the service. But the biggest, uh, most important uh, consideration was um, that it, the, the, uh, the, their financial situation wasn't at a, situ at a place where they could uh, afford um, the broadband service offered by the rural carriers. Okay, thank you. For that. Rebecca, could yes. I jump in? And, and it's um, a story that I don't know gets enough attention, but Kelly and I were asked when this first started to contact the carriers and see what could be done to help these families that didn't have connectivity. And every one of the carriers was just really willing to help out. But what was so amazing is when we started to talk with the URTA folks, they'd already set up these call centers and started taking calls and and were move, mobilized to make sure that these families that needed the connectivity had that and i was really impressed by that and and uh, as i had conversations with some of these uh, individuals it's clear that that's not something that could be sustained but they just immediately uh, jumped in met the need regardless of and not looking for, for that uh, payment right away. And I know many of those have expired, but I, I hope that whatever plan we, we put in place moving forward really recognizes the contribution to these communities that these carriers have made and how important they are. I just, I'm always impressed by the value that they bring and, and really the community mindedness that they have for those that live in their communities. Thank you, thank you, Jim, and I'll I'll relate that uh, those those uh, sentiments and thoughts um, back to the uh, URTA members. It's um, it's really rural carriers have a mindset that they are the community solution for uh, communications issues, and uh, try and try, try diligently. I believe every every single one of them is is diligent at trying to meet those community needs in in a in a very rapid and uh, effective way. That's good to hear, and I agree. Um, maybe if there's someone out there at some point, if there is an, an urban side to this, uh, there was um, some connection and opportunities uh, to fulfill the needs in um, the underserved urban areas would be interested to hear as well. Um, with that, uh, my next question, I would like to um, direct this to uh, Jim and Sarah with the prospect of a blended or hybrid model of learning at some or many of the schools this fall, what would you say are the remaining online uh, learning challenges? Um, Sarah, why don't we start with you? Ah, oh, numerous. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, so from the, the strength side of it, um, I think it's important that everyone knows that our state has invested in digital teaching and learning for K-12 over the past four years. So that is $65 million that has gone into the districts and the charter schools who are participating in that program um, to be able to build not just their infrastructure, but also their capacity to deliver on digital learning. Um, it is one of the reasons that in the state of Utah, from the day that remote closure was announced, which was a Friday afternoon, that our schools were able to start offering preliminary, oh, it's getting dark, uh, preliminary learning experiences um, to their students and families two days later. Comparatively, other states, even like Washington, took multiple weeks to be able to deliver in that space. 
Um, so we're, we're in a good spot. It doesn't mean we're in a great spot uh, when it comes to digital learning. So by like the differential I would share is although we have invested in a lot of these tools, they really were focused on what does that look like in a classroom. So I may be using Canvas, but I'm delivering Canvas traditionally before this in a very face-to-face -face way, um, using it as a supplement to my instruction as opposed to really one of the primary drivers. So a lot of work has been done in our districts over the summer to be able to help increase capacity. Um, the quick story I'll share and then I'll turn it over to Jim is that um, recently, so Weber School District put together an opportunity to be able to teach their teachers how to more effectively use Canvas to meet the needs of kids. This was a summer setting, it was opt-in. They were hoping that half their teachers would wanna participate. Um, they have a 90% turnout rate in terms of teachers who are like, I wanna know more, how do I do this effectively? Um, and they're showing up on their own time in the summer to be able to build that capacity so they can serve their kids moving forward. Um, I definitely think it's something where some of our greatest needs are about supporting our teachers to better understand what tools are available to them and how to effectively use those tools to support student instruction. Um, but we are taking strides that direction and hope to have more resources for the field to support that learning in an individualized way within the next few weeks. Sarah, um, I have a question. Uh, the, the, in, in our survey of URTA members, there were some responses back saying that the parents were qu quite frustrated in some situations where there were multiple platforms yep. that they had to <laughs> learn in order to get to interface with all the different schools. Is it, is it your experience now that everybody's going to be using Canvas as the platform across the state so that, so that parents don't have to learn three different protocols in order to interface with their school? Yes and no. Um, so yes, it is definitely something that we've heard. And yes, we have seen the majority of, especially our larger systems, move that direction. So before um, COVID-19, I'd actually say that the majority of our elementary teachers were in a Google Classroom, whereas our secondary were in Canvas. And so they were kind of bouncing back and forth between those. Um, it was really clearly heard by parents um, as well as by our agency that they were just lost. It was all over the place. There were too many links. It was confusing. Am I in a Zoom? Am I in a WebEx? Am I in Canvas? Where am I? Um, to be able to support their students. What we've seen is the majority of our districts have shifted to a Canvas for All model um, so that it's really that one-stop shop that parents are going to be able to go to um, to support their kids moving forward. I will say we do have some, um, especially some of our charter schools who may not have opted into the Canvas space, mainly because they're a K-8 or a K-6 um, that are gonna make decisions um, that are probably more conducive to what they had built into, as well as the age of the students they serve. Thank you. Yep. So Canvas is an option and uh, will be used pretty effectively across the board, but there are some pockets that are gonna stay with Google Classroom and there are even other solutions that, that some districts are using. So Sarah, are you done or uh, can I jump in now? Okay, perfect. Um, I won't uh, retread any of the ground hopefully that, uh, that Sarah's talked about, but we know that universities and uh, K-12 schools are making their plans and, and I've talked to some of the superintendents and their their uh, plans are due August 1st and uh, quite a bit in, in the state of Utah. But there are other groups that I'm part of that uh, around the country. And it's pretty clear that, that we know we're gonna have to stay at home. And, and I'm hearing the number 30%. I've heard that from several different sources that they think that even if we went back to school, at least 30% of the students would be held back at home by their parents and, and may even be greater than that. And depending on how cases uh, progress, you know, we know that we're going to be having to do this this blended environment and maybe a completely an online environment. And there are some real challenges to that. Um, I think it's interesting. I was talking to Scott at Canyons District, and they're going to go to an A-B day where uh, just you come twice a week. There'll be two days, two A days, two B days, and one day you'll be in the classroom in person, and the other day you'll be online completely. And that's just because 
it's really difficult to have students in front of you and then also students that are online and try and address both of those groups. So that's one way that one district is looking at addressing that. And, and we know the difficulties of that. We know that, you know, we have 1,200 uh, rooms around the state that, that we conduct these classes that are hybrid, a lot of them hybrid classes. And it just takes um, the technology, it takes the understanding of how to do that, the, the pedagogy from the teacher and the instructors. And so, you know, there are those challenges. And, and then there's just the challenges of, of we saw uh, when we started, we were doing some cloud filtering and most of the districts filter with hardware right there on site, but we were doing some cloud filtering. We had far less than 150,000 devices. We knew we, we were actually licensed for 150,000 devices, but there were fewer than that that were being taken home. And what we saw is we had to bump that up and we got to over 400,000 devices that were being taken home just in that March, April, May timeframe. We really think that going back into the fall that, that uh, you're going to see more like 600, 650,000 devices that will be going home. And then the districts are having to adjust to that. I, I know that some of the frustrations that we've had uh, are, and me personally, is that we've got a lot of our resources locked up in those schools and never had thought about shutting the schools down and not having access to those resources. So we're trying to think about how we adjust our what we're doing to meet that new paradigm, that new environment that we're, and, and so can we do Wi-Fi that is uh, on, pervasive on the campus? And there are, there are other options and things that we're looking at. And, and I know that, uh, you know, we've, we've learned that one of our most important connections right now is with Comcast, and they are by far the largest provider of home access for our students. And, and we've seen a tremendous increase in in traffic with that provider, and so there's just you know all these little things that have got to come together, and that that just are these impediments. But I think you know it, we're we're working through those, and at least I'm part of this K-12 advisory group uh, with Cisco, and there was uh, one person who had talked about how she was in a district in Ohio that didn't have an LMS, so they didn't have a Canvas. They didn't have good connectivity to the internet. Uh, they didn't have any devices that people could take home. They just had none of that. And in a six week period, they had to come up to speed and do all of that. At least we did start from that perspective or that, that place. Uh, but, but certainly this, just this engagement of the students, engagement of the teachers and how to make that happen. It really comes down to that. Once all the technology is in place, how, how do those individuals really engage with their students as teachers and then the students, how do they engage? Uh, I don't know how they're going to do that. Uh, we're a lot of challenges to make that happen. Definitely. Um, I, it's interesting what you said about going back to school and how maybe not all the parents will be sending their children and the different, um, I'm glad to hear that more are using the Canvas model which I know the state invested in, so it's nice that they're getting a return on their investment in that regard. Um, it, so I'm also thinking too that if, if things do you know, unravel and the, the, the students end up having to be at home, it's still being able to have this Wi-Fi that was talked about earlier or a space, you know, some type of a, uh, a shared space, co-working space that's still set up at a distance so that are there opportunities, you know, to, just to continue to allow the underserved communities? I know it's difficult in the rural area because that's distance, but I'm talking within urban areas, number one, to allow them to continue um, to come to a location where they can have access. And in the rural areas, I understand um, the use of buses, the school buses have been used to uh, share even in Salt Lake, you know, Dale Roberts uh, out there at Granite, they were, uh, they could go out and, and do some demographic studies and see where their students were that didn't have the, the economic capabilities of, of connectivity. And they were driving those school buses out and advertising where they were going to be. And uh, because of the battery systems and other things in the buses, they'll, they'll last a long time and be able to, to, to transmit that. And then you look at what Jason Air, I, I mean, I, I think this is just brilliant, but, uh, he went out there and, and got um, 
utopia to bring in a one gig circuit into an apartment complex. And then they, they reallocated some access points for wireless access points into those 10 buildings in that apartment complex. And then uh, were able to set up the students so that they had the ability to, so, so they served 84 students for about $200 a month plus the moving of the access points. And they had good connectivity to, to the internet and it really extended out so it wasn't something that every person in those complex was able to use, but the students were that didn't have any other connectivity had access. And you know, I, I think there are other uh, creative ways of, of providing this uh, access that are low cost but really very impactful. Thank you. That's a good story to hear. That's what I was wondering if we had a. a, a an urban story, and that's that's one right there. Well, those are two. Those are two actually. Because <laughs> Dale's parking his buses out there in, in okay. uh, yeah. areas, and, and then what Jason's done. So, right. Both in urban areas. Um, so to tack on to that question, uh, and for anybody um, to what are what do you see as the potential for a state-led digital inclusion program? So I don't want to take a lot of time on this because we are running close to our to our end, but I would like to hear what maybe any of the panelists have to say about that, or um, anyone if has a comment. If we could just leave our limit our comments to one minute. Um, but number one, the potential for a state-led digital inclusion program, and then number two, what can broadband providers offer or do to address quality connections for every Utah citizen. So they're kind of kind of related. We're talking about connection with the through the providers and then we're talking about the actual um, what can be done on a state level to help um, include everyone digitally, whether it's through education or um, or devices or connection. And I'm going to open this up to, let's we'll start with Jim, because I can see I, you're ready yeah, to go. <laughs> if I could just jump in. And, and I just come back to the numbers that we saw at San Juan County. And I, I, I'm going to state something that's just so obvious, everybody's going to go, why would I even say that? But, you know, we can't be inclusive until you get, in the case of San Juan, fiber into, into that area. And, and until it's physically there, there, any other thing that we try and do, they'll just always be underserved. They'll always be disadvantaged until that happens. And, and that is a long-term project. When I started 20 years ago, we had no fiber south of Moab. And we looked at that fiber and we said, how are we gonna get fiber from Moab to Blanding? And the carrier stepped up and there were different uh, opportunities and, and they put that fiber in. And so we were able to go from these radios and just a, a really limited capability that was just at the schools to fiber that, that really has increased the schools, but it's also increased the access for all of those who live in Monticello and Blanding and those areas in between. So we've got to get the fiber there. And, and that's just, it's just so critical. And once we get the fiber there, we can do these other things. Yeah, Rebecca, the, uh the you know it's, it's really a supply and demand side uh, observation uh, you know on the supply side the uh the rural carriers in in utah have have deployed fiber in expansive areas and that's due in part to a state program a state universal service program that that uh, helps offset the the huge infrastructure costs in delivering that uh, that supply on the supply side the demand side is really, as I mentioned before, is really where the target should be uh, on a going uh, going forward. Um, you know, it can continue and maintain the supply side supports and 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 continue to expand and extend into San Juan and other areas that are that are lacking that facility. But um, your biggest bang for the buck will be on the on the demand side, and that involves and it's 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 everybody on this call knows what that is. It's financial and it's also a, 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 accessibility, meaning do they know have the technology to use the technology? There's a certain baseline where you actually have to know how to use and manipulate a computer screen and, and, uh, and, and work through that. And so there's an education component to it. There's a financial support component to it. 
And uh, I don't think, I, I think that, you know, in past, we've had surveys and I think uh, Kelly did a survey years ago that there were in Utah where they, a lot of people said, well, I don't think I need internet. And so I don't, I'm not interested in having it in my home. I think we're past that. I think most people in the, in the state know that internet is a vital, a vital utility, a vital component to their uh, ongoing operations, both socially, financially, educationally, and, um, and professionally. And so in that regard, I think we passed that hurdle, but there is a hurdle, there, is a, there are a, a good number of people who need education to understand how to use it. And, uh, and then there needs to be a very serious look at how to make sure that those households that are not financially in that position to actually afford it, um, if, is there a way to provide some support for them? Um, I've got a couple comments I'd love to share. You know, we, we'd like to see uh, broadband treated a little more like we do uh, roads from a state perspective, uh, where, you know, you'll see a community out, you know, far away from everything else. And those communities usually are not responsible for building the roads out to those communities. We have county roads, we have state roads, we have federal roads, or at least programs uh, for funding those. Uh, and, that, and that gives all of our communities access to transportation infrastructure on a, on a pretty equal basis, even though those local communities are still responsible for what they have in their local communities. And from a broadband perspective, you know, we do have communities that are at a severe disadvantage because of where they are geographically uh, and that there aren't fiber roads to those communities or there are very few options, you know, it may be a monopoly or something that has access to that. No, there's no competition. Uh, and so I'd rather see more competitive landscape and a more active role from the state to level the playing field for communities uh, so that every every community has the ability to uh, be involved in this and take care of those communities. Uh, from a digital inclusion perspective at the local level, we you know we'd love to see a better bar set. You know we we see lifeline type programs that mirror uh, federal programs and and they don't work very well. You know, we'd rather see people raising that bar saying, hey, we need 100 meg, uh, we need good service, and it would be good to provide good subsidies uh, for low income households. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the broadband providers aren't in a position to subsidize those and, and uh, you know, they need to pay their bills. Um, we have various programs that we try to help with that, but to have the state involvement to provide more access to that and not funnel it through very protective programs that limit the scope to incumbent providers. I mean, it's, you know, there's this garbage about sending it through only eligible telecommunications carriers uh, for telephone companies. It's like, why are we even talking about telephone anymore? You know, this ought to be any broadband provider that meets certain metrics for high speed internet, meaning real high speed, like 100 meg, I should should be supported and get those connections to low income households and address the digital divide issues we have. So anyways, just a few of my thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. Um, anybody else from the panel have um, something to add to that? As far as the digital inclusion and what can be done to address um, connections, quality connections for every Utah citizen. Yeah, so I'll jump in real quick. This is Sarah. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the, the key points um, that I heard um, echoing from others that I've heard um, is really that idea of making sure we're reaching every family. So one of the big barriers that we have is that so much of our communication, whether it's related to K-12 education, COVID, whatever the case, is being pushed out via English and English only. Um, so having opportunities to make sure that we have communication tools that reach every family within our state, I think is incredibly important um, because oftentimes we see that as the number one barrier. If we send home forms for free and reduced lunch that are only in English to families, guess who we're going to get them back from? English speaking families. Um, so it's incumbent on not just K-12, but I think the broader conversation in the state and broadband to make sure we have tools that are accessible to all of our families. Rebecca, this is Vikram. Can I add a comment? Uh -huh. Yep. Um, I just wanted to make one comment. I think um, just going off of what everyone said, um, there has been a 
lack of funding for digital inclusion programs. If you look across the state, um, you know, there really are few digital inclusion programs that are sustainable. You have most of the private sector support is really in the form of, you know, one time or events. Um, but as far as, um, you know, the need, the, there really is a need for the state to support um, both long term um, education and technical support funding, but also something that I think Utah lacks is a device refurbishing ecosystem. We have, you know, I I've worked with individuals that provide refurbished devices, um, but as far as setting up more sustainable ecosystems um, to provide ongoing supplies, um, you know, these are just some gaps that I think without, you know, state leadership and support on, I don't think we're going to get there as fast as we, we ought to. You know, Rebecca, I like that. I like that idea of device refurbishment. I, I'm sure that uh, if we took a poll from everybody here, there would be a, a number of us that have uh, laptops or devices that can connect to the internet that are just sitting around because they are maybe at one, two, three generations, ten years old, but still functioning. And uh, if the if the state had a program, even if even, even you know, a donation tax credit program, you know, or, or some donation facility where they could go to and, and give those uh, devices to a program that would uh, in turn pass them along to uh, households that, uh, that don't have those, uh, those uh, devices, that might be very interesting. Yeah, and, and the state, I mean, I think the main issue there is, um, I think it happens kind of organically, but when you have a system set up, like if you have a school district that has their own, you know, self-sustaining program, then a school district, you know, has their own means and capacity to refurbish a set number of devices every year, and they have a system to give them to wow. students in need. And I think those are the sorts of ongoing, you know, they have these one-off events, but Usually, you know, in some of these best practice models, you have a nonprofit or you have a ongoing public-private partnership that facilitates that. Well, we will, I will check around and see about that. Um, I know I was in a webinar not too long ago where they said the technology today is changed so much that it's almost has not become viable to um, refurbish devices anymore, which I know this is something that's been going on for. Uh, decades but um, anyway I'm not to discount it because I'm not the expert on that but um, Rebecca you might check it. with my check with Logan district I know that uh, when Dave Wong was there they put in a program where they actually uh, provided the device to the family to the student and and made it so that they would take that home at the end of you know when they were going to get rid of it so it was it was theirs from was the theirs. beginning they took better care of it and and they provided a purchase option for them. So they were getting a, a newer device that they'd had uh, all along. So that's, you know, that's that there probably some... an excellent way, an excellent way to do it. Yeah. Give them a new device school. It's yours. Take care of it. I like that. No, I will. I'll check into that. Maybe you can give me a contact information on that. Sure. Um, we have reached the end of our, our two hours. It's hard to believe. I think it's really flown through. This has been really great information. I've taken some notes and I needed this to uh, pass this on. I'm putting together, helping to put together a report. Um, also with Sarah Young, uh, she had to jump off to get to another meeting. Appreciate her participation and all of the panelists and all the presenters today. Um, I'm going to, our, I just wanted to know, I, our broadband at utah.gov, um, webpage. I know some of you access it to get content. Um, don't shoot me, but it's gone. <laughs> so um, I wanted you to know that this has now been um, embraced and taken into GoEd's uh, website. Um, so it's going to look different. And so some of the information maybe you have been able to access before. I mean, a lot of it 
has not been updated for a while from our broadband site. You know, Kelly did a great job and her staff at the time. Um, we have up, keep the maps updated, so they are still there. And um, they brought the maps of the month. I made sure that they made, kept those on there. You will find those links still there. I'm hoping everything that um, you used or loved before is still there. It's going to look different, but in some ways it'll be better because um, there won't be any uh, hopefully broken pages or getting somewhere that doesn't go anywhere. Um, and at the bottom of it, of that page, you will see there is um, our events, the calendar. So that's where we will be posting our, our meetings, have been posting them in the past and will continue to post in the future. Uh, of course, the broadband maps are at broadband.utah.gov forward slash map and locate.utah.gov are commercial maps. Um, I, this is the end of our meeting. I think um, Roger had a really cool, um, really quick ex uh, example of a, a smart city um, that they did. And if anybody else has any other comments, um, feel free to stay on. We'd like to hear from you. But if anybody needs to jump off at this time, this is kind of like our, we're wrapping things up and now you can stay in the Canyonlands room for at least I've had this room scheduled for another 30 minutes. <laughs> So you can do your networking if you want to talk to each other or send message or anything. I appreciate everyone coming. We'll see October, um, that means October 13th, I believe, 10 a.m. at virtual. We'll do it 11.30 if it's in person at GoEd. Roger, I would like to hear your um, example of a smart city success. Okay, th this is just a preview. We'll probably do a more formal presentation of this, but I'm just going to share real quick my screen show you a cool system that we've been working on which is a wildfire detection system and so if you look at this uh, hopefully that's coming through the zoom but you've got some optical feeds and also some thermal camera feeds so these are some pretty nice uh, cameras that give you a thermal image uh, so we can analyze these videos and, and look for fires uh, you know we have all these other problems we worry about with coronavirus and one of the other things we worry about is wildfire and so um, we, we look, use this to uh, try to help our first responders know when there's fires. Uh, this page here is actually analyzing this video on the fly. Um, so this is a histogram below that's actually live updating with uh, the intensity of each pixel on the screen and we can identify temperature ranges. And so if there's a little fire, even just a few pixels uh, in this image anywhere, uh, we, we hope to be able to alarm on that and, and help our first responders um, and so there's, there's a lot of data and a lot of stuff to talk about in this, but it's a really cool thing that we're uh, deploying across uh, cities across the Wasatch Front and hopefully expanding that uh, across other areas in the state that are at high risk for wildfires. So there's your 30 second yeah, preview, <laughs> more information forthcoming. Okay, well, we'll have you on the next agenda. That's, that's cool. That's, that's neat. That, that puts someone who for me is uh, a digital immigrant uh, and a smart city immigrant uh, uh, gives me some understanding, a visual understanding of what a smart city can do and is. So, cool. thanks. Rebecca, I have one uh -huh. other question. Um, so I wanted to know, you had talked in the past that the Broadband Advisory Council had explored the idea of putting together like a leadership committee um, or maybe at some point in the past. And, you know, I just wonder with all of this momentum and energy around this topic, um, I'm wondering, you know, because you're, you know, you only have so much um, bandwidth, uh, no pun intended, that you can give um, to this council because of the other duties you have. But I wonder if we had a leadership group within the bride. Ban Advisory Council, how we might be able to accomplish more, um, especially as far as, you know, the things that we'd like to see being advocated for um, on a state level that, you know, as a state government employee, you wouldn't be able to do. Um, so I just wanted to throw that exploratory question out there, um, just because 
I know that between these companies and different providers that are all in part of this council that we're talking about a lot of great things, but I think unless there's um, more um, kind of collective um, and focused energy, I think we might not be able to accomplish as many things. Anybody want to make a motion? I think that's what we're looking, you're looking for. I, I, I agree. I understand. I, I did post this, I think, right at the very beginning when I uh, first took over this job. We wanted to just carry on as we did, or if we wanted to make it um, a formal body. That's, that's up to the council. Um, I facilitate, and I will be open to any uh, response to that, or if you want to email me or call me, you're welcome to do that. So thanks for mentioning that again, Vikram. Do we have anything else from anyone? I, I'm really pleased to see so many of you attending and um, let me just ask this, maybe do you prefer um, an online meeting or in person or a mix? I just couldn't put myself through the, the social distancing thing. That, that Canyonlands room is just not big enough <laughs> for us to social distance, but. We'll see how it goes in October. I appreciate all of you attending and for your input. I think it's been really good. This has been really good for me and I've, I've learned a lot and I think it kind of helps give us some direction um, for the future and appreciate all the work that all the different entities and the broadband providers have done to get broadband and connection to our citizens across the state. With that, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Kelly, Jeff, um, and the panel, Jim, Allison, Sarah, and Doug. Appreciate everyone's participation. And we'll see you in October. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.